Ni hao community covenant. This is my nephew who speaks Chinese. His name is Eli. Gage is here too, but he's running around. Uh, but I just want to say good morning and welcome to our next installment of Church at Home. My name's Gage! Thanks, Gage. He's excited for church. Uh, for the next 50 minutes... Mommy. Can't sit. Or, or. For the next 50 minutes or so, we are going to sing, pray, hear a short sermon, worship through tithes and, through tithes and offerings, and hear a benediction. You'll get the most out of church at home. If you have a few things here with you, make sure you have an unlit candle and a lighter or a match. If you haven't already downloaded the resource provided on our website for this morning, you might want to consider doing that. On the same page as this video, you can download activities for the kids and uh, notes for the sermon. Finally, something to drink and a pastry of your choice might be a nice addition to your church at home experience. If you still need these things, just simply pause the video and get the materials you need for this morning and hit play to continue to worship with our service. I don't know what your past week has, has been like. Maybe it's been a week of, of great celebration and everything's worked out. Or maybe it's been one of those weeks that have been more difficult. Kids are going back to school. Everybody's having to juggle schedules. Maybe this week you felt really connected. Maybe this week you felt completely disconnected. Regardless of how the past week has been, it's important that we as a church pause together to remember that we are not alone. And even though the week might have been so very hectic, you remained faithful and you remained present. We light this candle each week as a visual symbol that we are not alone.
Your love is like radiant diamonds bursting inside us. We cannot contain your love will surely come find us like blazing wildfires singing your name God of mercy sweet love of mine I have surrendered to your design may the sun Across the sky, these hallelujah be In our sermon series, Character Summer, each week looking at a different character, learning from their life in the hopes that our lives might be changed. And this morning, we are with one of my favorite characters in all of the Bible. And that character is Peter. I love Peter. And one of the reasons I love Peter is he is so very human. He has high highs. He has low lows. When he, when he succeeds, I celebrate. When he crashes and burns, I totally relate. He speaks before he thinks. He leaps before he looks. He's so very human. And I appreciate him so very much. Now this morning, we're going to be looking at two specific moments in Peter's life. And interestingly enough, both of these moments take place around a fire. Now the first fire story happens the night that Jesus is arrested. And it has already been a hard night for our boy Peter. 
He's one of the three disciples that goes with Jesus into the Garden of Gethsemane. And Jesus tells the three, hey, stay awake. Pray. And he falls asleep. Twice. And Jesus has to come and wake him up and he, he, he kind of scolds him. Why are you sleeping? Get up and pray that you will not fall into temptation. But then the night went from bad to worse because soon after that, a crowd comes to arrest Jesus. Peter responds by grabbing a sword and lopping off this dude's ear. Jesus picks up the ear, sticks it back on the guy's head, and then... He scolds Peter a second time. No more of this, Jesus said. The men that had come to seize Jesus arrest him, take him away. Peter initially flees, but then follows, but follows at a distance. Jesus is taken inside and, and Peter lingers on the outside in a courtyard and in the courtyard, there are some men that have started a fire to keep warm. And so Peter goes over to the fire to keep warm himself. And while he's at the fire, a servant girl sees Peter and says to him, this man, referring to Peter, was with him, referring to Jesus. And so this girl says, Peter's with Jesus. But watch how Peter responds. Woman, I don't know him. This scenario plays out two more times. A little later, someone else saw him, Peter, and said, you were also one of them. Man, I am not, Peter replied. About an hour later, Another asserted, certainly this fellow was with him, for he is a Galilean. Peter replied, man, I don't know what you're talking about. Just as he was speaking, the rooster crowed. The rooster crowed. Earlier that evening at the event that we call the Last Supper, Jesus is sitting there with his closest friends, with his disciples, one of whom was Peter, and during the meal, he said, one of you will betray me. One of you will betray me. And Peter was quick to go, not me. Uh-uh, not going to be me. I'm never going to betray you. I'm never going to stop following you. I'm always going to be with you. And then Jesus looks directly at Peter and says, oh, Peter, before this night is through, you will deny me three times. Before the rooster crows, you will deny me three times. So when Peter hears that rooster crow, he is immediately reminded of what Jesus had said. When the rooster crowed, Peter was so very aware of his betrayal. But then it just got worse because the scriptures say that when the rooster crows, Jesus looks directly at Peter. Makes eye contact with Peter. You ever been caught in a lie? You ever been caught red-handed? Ever been found out? Have you ever been painfully aware that you've blown it? And, and when I say painfully aware that you're blown. I'm not talking about the mistake where, oh, I forgot to take out the trash or I, I, I washed whites with reds. No, that's not the mistake I'm talking about. I'm talking about when we are denying Christ. When we are denying following Christ. You see, we've all spent time at this fire. We've all had our moments where we're very aware of our sin, of our mistakes, of our cowardice. 
we've all spent time at this fire and being familiar with what it feels like to be at this fire, we're not surprised at how Peter responds. You see, after the rooster crows, after Jesus makes eye contact with him, the scriptures say that Peter went away and wept bitterly. He wept bitterly. Like I said, we've all spent time at this fire. We've all, in light of our failures and our fears, wept bitterly. We've all spent time at this fire, and it's appropriate for us to spend time at this fire. It's appropriate for us to, to own our mistakes. I was in a conversation with someone this past week, and we were talking about what repentance is. And his description of repentance captured my imagination. As we were talking about repentance is, he responded by saying, Repentance requires us to willingly and unclenchingly own our stuff. I love this understanding of what repentance requires. It requires that we willingly and unclenchingly own our stuff to let go of the pretense that we haven't made mistakes, to recognize that the rooster has crowed in our lives because we have failed to live in the way that God has called us to live. We have failed to courageously follow Jesus. We have chosen the easy way, the more comfortable way, we deny Christ just like Peter did. We might not do it as overtly, but we do it regularly. When we choose something or someone other than Jesus, in that moment, we betray Christ. When we choose self-sufficiency rather than God-dependency, we deny Christ. Christ, and we do it all the time. So in this way, we're very much like Peter because we routinely deny that we belong to Jesus. And so we shouldn't be surprised when we hear the rooster crow. And our response should be to weep bitterly. We are all familiar with this fire. And it's appropriate to spend some time at this fire acknowledging our multiple forms of betrayal. Fortunately for Peter and fortunately for us, this is not the end of the story. There is a second fire in the story. But between fire number one and fire number two, some significant things take place. Jesus is convicted. He is crucified, publicly executed, dead, and buried. But on the third day, he defeats the grave. He overcomes death. And he begins to appear to many of his followers in multiple places, multiple times. Now, on one occasion, the disciples, not knowing when they're going to see Jesus again, because apparently he shows up and then he's gone, not knowing when they're going to see him again, they return to what, well, what they're used to doing. They go fishing. Why? Because a bunch of them are fishermen. So they're out fishing about a hundred yards from shore when this guy shows up on the beach and, and he calls out to them, haven't you any fish? Which is a terrible question to ask a bunch of fishermen that are getting skunked. 
don't you have any fish? They answered, no, <laughs> we don't have any fish. Thank you. Then the guy says, hey, throw the nets on the right side of the boat. Now, Peter should have at that moment realized it was Jesus on the shore because three years earlier, almost the identical thing had taken place. But in this moment, Peter doesn't recognize Jesus. He doesn't recognize his voice. He doesn't recognize him because he's 100 yards away. And he doesn't remember what had taken place three years earlier. But they do what the guy says. They throw the nets over and bam, fish on. Or more accurately, fishes on, mini fish on. In fact, one person actually counted. You see this in the Gospel of John that they caught 153 large fish. Leave it to a bunch of fishermen to make sure that we knew they didn't catch little fish. They caught large fish. How many fishermen have you known that go, yeah, I caught a lot of fish, but they were really small? No. Fishermen always say, large fish. It's at this moment that one of the fishermen, one of the disciples, described as the one Jesus loved, which most scholars agree is the Apostle John, it's at this moment that John recognizes it's Jesus and says to everybody else in the boat, it's the Lord. Now, when Peter, when Peter hears, it's the Lord, as soon as he hears it, Peter jumps out of the boat now, this is the second time that we've seen Jesus, uh, seen Peter jump out of a boat. You remember the first time. They're all out in a boat, and Jesus comes walking on the water, and Peter goes, if that's really you, Lord, call to me, and I'll come walking out to the water. And Jesus says, come on down. And, and Peter gets out of the boat and goes walking on the water. It's a great story. This time, though, Peter doesn't wait for that. He just jumps out of the boat, which is a silly thing to do if your name is Peter. You see, Peter was not Peter's given name. His given name was Simon. Jesus had a few years earlier renamed Simon Peter. Now, if you don't remember that story, Jesus was asking the disciples, hey, who are people saying that I am? And the disciples go, well, some are saying you're Elijah. Others are saying you're a prophet. Some are saying you're John the Baptist. Some are saying this and some are saying that. But then Jesus narrows down the question and says, yeah, but who do you say I am? And Peter jumps all over the question. And he says, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. Peter just jumps on the question. You are the Christ, the son of the living God. And watch how Jesus responds to Peter. Jesus replied, blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah, for this was not revealed to you by man, but by my father in heaven. And I tell you that you are are Peter. And on this rock I will build my church and the gates of hell will not overcome it. Jesus renamed him Peter, which means, catch this, rock. A guy named Rock jumps out of a boat. Like I said, not the thing to do if you're named Rock. But then again, this fits into Peter's character. He's a leap before you look, speak before you th think kind of guy. So he jumps out of the boat and he swims the hundred yards all the way to the beach and comes to where Jesus is. And when he gets to the shore, he discovers that Jesus has already started a fire. And here is the second fire. And just like at the first fire, Peter is asked three questions. Jesus asks Peter, Simon, son of John, did you notice that? Simon, son of John, he didn't say Peter. He calls him 
by his old name. Simon, son of John, do you truly love me more than these? Yes, Lord, he said. You know that I love you. Jesus said, feed my lambs. Again, Jesus said, Simon, son of John, do you truly love me? He answered, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. Jesus said, take care of my sheep. The third time he said, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Peter was hurt because Jesus asked him a third time, do you love me? Apparently, Peter missed the significance of being asked three times if he was affiliated with Jesus. Not that long before, he had been asked three times if he was affiliated with Jesus and three times he said no. Jesus is giving Peter a second chance. Simon, son of John, Simon, let's start all over again. Do you love me? This time, Peter responds, yes, yes, I love you. Yes, I'm with you. In fact, Peter says it this way. Lord, you know all things and you know that I love you. At the second fire, Peter is given a second chance. At the second fire, we see Peter receiving grace from Jesus. At the second fire, we see Jesus extending compassion to Peter. And he will ultimately say, follow me and feed my sheep. The fact that Jesus re-invites Peter to be one of his disciples is evident of the compassion passionate love of God made evident in and through Jesus Christ. At the second fire, Peter receives a second chance. Two fires. Fire number one. Fire number one is marked by bitter weeping at the realization of failure. Fire two is is marked by a second chance. A second chance to follow Jesus and to feed Jesus' sheep. I wonder, which fire is your primary residence? Don't get me wrong. We need to spend time at both fires. There is a time to acknowledge our failure and to weep bitterly. But there's also a time to acknowledge the love of God extended to us. But which of the two fires is your primary residence? Now how we answer, how you answer this question reveals something about how we view and understand the character and nature of God. If our primary residence is the first fire then we tend to view God as primarily a God that is perpetually disappointed in us. Stern and disapproving, head shaking, finger wagging. Is this how you imagine God to primarily be towards you? Or is the second fire your primary residence? When you think about God, do you first think of his tremendous love extended towards you? Because here's the thing. Too often we conclude, we conclude that our, our sins and our failures are abundantly real, but that the love of God and the compassion of God is something we merely hope is real. Brennan Manning writes in The Furious Longing of God, Christians find it easier to believe that God exists than that God loves them. But I'm here to tell you this morning that the love of God is every bit as real as your acknowledged failure and fear. 
Peter experienced two fires, and so do we. And we are not to avoid the first fire. It is important to acknowledge our sin, to do what the late Dave Busby said, to take a deep whiff of our personal cesspool. For when we are aware of the stench of our sin, then the forgiveness, the fragrance of forgiveness is that much more beautiful. When we are aware of our betrayals, then redemption becomes that much more powerful. I love what Manning has to say about this, and this is a long quote, so stay with me. Getting honest with ourselves does not make us unacceptable to God. It does not distance us from God, but draws us to Him as nothing else can and opens us anew to the flow of grace. While Jesus calls each of us to a more perfect life, we cannot achieve it on our own. To be alive is to be broken. To be broken is to stand in need of grace. It is only through grace that any of us could dare to hope that we could become more like Christ. The saved sinner with the tilted halo has been converted from mistrust to trust, has arrived at an inner poverty of spirit and lives as best he or she can in rigorous honesty with self, others, and God. The question the gospel of grace puts to us is simply this. Who shall separate you from the love of Christ? What are you afraid of? Are you afraid that your weakness could separate you from the love of Christ? It can't. Are you afraid that your inadequacies could separate you from the love of Christ? They can't. Are you afraid that your inner poverty could separate you from the love of Christ? It can't. Difficult marriage, loneliness, anxiety over the children's future, they can't. Negative self-image, it can't. Economic hardship, racial hatred, street crime, they can't. Rejection by loved ones or the suffering of loved ones, they can't. Persecution by authorities, going to jail, they can't. Nuclear war, it can't. Mistakes, fears, uncertainties, they can't. The gospel of grace calls out, nothing can ever separate you from the love of God made visible in Christ Jesus, our Lord. Nothing can ever separate you from the love of God made visible in Christ Jesus, our Lord. You must be convinced of this. Trust it and never forget to remember. Everything else will pass away, but the love of Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Faith will become vision, hope will become possession, but the love of Jesus Christ that is stronger than death endures forever. In the end, it is the one thing you can hang on to. The second fire blazes more brilliantly in our minds, our hearts, and our souls when we are aware of how much we don't deserve it, how much we don't deserve the second chance. The first fire is important, but the second fire, the love and compassion of Jesus at the second fire needs to be our primary residence. Being the beloved is our identity, the core of our existence. It is not merely a lofty thought, an inspiring idea, or one name among many. It is the name by which God knows us and the way he relates to us. May we be like Peter, Spend time at both fires. But please, make sure your primary residence is on the beach at the second fire.
again God, I'm begging please again I need you Oh, I need you Walking down these desert roads Water for my thirsty soul I need you Oh, I need you Your forgiveness Is like sweet, sweet honey on my lips Like the sound of a symphony to my ears Like holy water on my the time that we give and receive the morning offering and during church at home can't pass a plate but there are multiple ways for you to continue to practice tithing and the way we describe tithing here at community covenant church is it's a combination of obedience and generosity all kidding aside it's seriously how we think about giving it's an act of obedience and generosity it's an act of discipleship. And for those of you that continue to grow in your practice of tithing, thank you, thank you, thank you. Because you give, we're able to do a number of things. There's multiple ways for you to continue to give. You can do online giving. You can text 84321, enter the amount, send, that easy. You can mail it or drop it by. And again, because you give, we're able to do a number of things. Speaking of the number of things that we are doing, one of our church family will be leaving next week, Karina Cortez. You might remember her. She was with us for a year and served as a volunteer in a number of places before going to YWAM in Honolulu and then going overseas to share the good news of Jesus Christ. And a number of you supported her. Well, she is leaving again for kind of part two 
Should we go into the base in Honolulu, be quarantined for two weeks, and then we'll be taking classes before, again, going out and sharing the good news. If you want more information or would like to get on her mail list so you can hear about what God's doing in and through her, or if you want to financially support her, here's the information. We'd really love for you to come alongside one of our church family as they go out. Speaking of someone in our church family going out, we have somebody else going to an exotic mission field, and that is, well, the Huffman family. They, they're going somewhere even more exotic than Honolulu. They're going to Edmonds, Oklahoma. <laughs> no, seriously, I mean, Aaron called me, what, about a week ago? Yeah, a little less than a week. Yeah, to go, hey, Mike, some stuff has happened. Um, a new job was made available, a new home. All kind of, it's a great opportunity for them. And as I told Aaron on the phone, as happy as I am for Aaron and Christine and the kids is how tremendously sad I am to be having a friend move to. Um, how can we be praying for you guys? And I'll let you know, we're going to be praying through tears. But uh, yeah. uh, Mike, I mean, originally it was praying for clarity. Uh, we, we didn't, we weren't, we were open to Oklahoma. We love California. Uh, we really just said, God, open the right doors to show us the way. And uh, like I told you over the phone, I never wanted to be the guy on the parable in the middle of the ocean screaming for God's help as the boats pass by. And every door in Oklahoma opened up. Last week, we were able to take the kids and Christine out there, and they just fell in love with the area. And, uh, yeah, it's a, it's a big move. It's a lot that happened in a very short time. Uh, when we asked for clarity, we forgot to ask God to do it at a pace that we could handle. <laughs> well, uh, it's but, like the old Jewish proverb. If you want to hear God laugh, tell him your plans. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, seriously. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, I guess really the plan for now is I'm actually going out ahead of the rest of the Huffmans um, to start work and kind of lay the groundwork for them. And once the house closes, um, I'll be coming back here to go out with the family. So really the prayer that, that we could use is for Christine. She's such a rock star already, um, but she's doing work, uh, distance learning with our kids. Uh, one thing I won't miss in California, sadly. Um, uh, and just all she's going to hold the house down by herself and uh if you can just pray for someone that is such a strong person um you know she's saying goodbye to a lot of people she's gone to this church really since she was born yeah. um you know i've i've been here since the fifth grade and i'm the rookie compared to her um and so she just her heart is so big for so many people that we have to say i never say goodbye that we'll see you soon because we will have yep. a guest bedroom and anyone's welcome to come out and stay, uh, not permanently in our guest room, but you can come out and check it out. Um, but yeah, just uh, for me, just being away from the family is going to be tough. So prayer for me is just staying strong in this uh, chapter of our life of being apart, which really we've never done. Um, but really for Christine and the kids that they just, um, you know, have God's hand of protection on them as they uh, kind of weather this last end of the storm without uh, without me there. Okay, so you're leaving next week, and then what's the general time frame for them joining you out there? Probably around the, the, somewhere in the 20s of September. All right, so church family, you've got one month to be able to help the Huffmans while he's in Oklahoma and to say your goodbyes or the until we see agains. Um, and then apparently we're all doing a road trip to Edmonds, Oklahoma, because they've got a guest room. Uh, hey, will you join me, family, as we pray for these guys? God, I, I thank you that you put Aaron in my life. God, I thank you that soon after I got to this church, he was one of the first people that reached out to me. Um, I, I thank you for the conversations that we've had, for the, the times we've laughed together, and I thank you for the times we've cried together. Um, God, I thank you that I can rest and we can rest on the truth that what brought us together had nothing to do with geography. It had everything to do with you and your spirit. And that's not going to change even though they're going to boomer-sumer land. Um, so God, 
be with this family that we love. Um, overwhelm them with the fact that they are loved by you and that they're loved by us. And God, may the transition be as smooth as such a crazy transition can be. We pray this all in the name of your son, Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Thanks, Mike. Got it, man. The in family. Um, thing I sometimes call beautiful pain. Yeah. Would you, would you please stand for the benediction this morning? And the benediction, it seems appropriate, is going to be coming from Peter, who we've been talking about throughout this morning. So would you please stand? And Peter says, and the God of all grace, and if anybody knows about that, it's Peter. And the God of all grace, who called you to his eternal glory in Christ, after you have suffered a little while, will himself restore you and make you strong, firm, and steadfast. And this is something that Peter understands. And then he says, to him be the power forever and ever. And all God's people said, amen.